The Broken Butterfly Written by Cyprian Jossen, Audiobook Chapter 1, Shadows Just call me a crazy lady. Far from the busy city of Awari, there was a big house called the Healer of All Healers Mental Hospital. It was in a forest, surrounded by lots of green plants, making it a peaceful and calming place. The building itself had a nice mix of red and different colors, welcoming daylight, unlike the usual gloomy psychiatric hospitals. People who were dealing with mental health issues came here to find some peace and relief. Some of them carried deep sorrows, which you could see on their faces. Inside the hospital, doctors and nurses took care of them and gave them medicine to help on their difficult journey. The hospital was surrounded by tall mango trees, pawpaw trees, and other fruit trees, making it feel like a beautiful orchard. Among these green friends, there were delicate rose flowers that bloomed. These flowers showed that even in tough times, nature can heal people's hearts. They added vibrant colors to the air, making the place look fancy and getting rid of the darkness and bringing light to the place. Within the confines of the hospital's interior, a myriad of inmate stories took root. These stories were akin to the branches of trees, swaying in unison, their leaves murmuring tales in the wind. The gentle breeze carried fragments of tales, stories woven with threads of struggle and threads of hope. Amidst the tough times and darkness, the Healer of All Healers Hospital became a symbol of hope. It showed that even when things were really hard, healing was still possible. When the sun started going down and the sky turned warm and gentle during sunset, the hospital felt like a place of optimism. It turned into a safe space where patients came to find comfort. It was like a peaceful retreat where they found a bit of peace and strength while dealing with their own struggles. It was a time when their inner battles paused and they could find some peace. In the small rooms where patients stayed, you could hear the sad sounds of female patients moaning, especially when male doctors were examining them. These bodies, holding many hidden stories, became the focus of attention during those times. Meanwhile, faint shadows and echoes of things from the past on the walls seemed to hide mysterious truths, secrets that only I knew about. These strange and scary things happened at night when I quietly left my room. I moved carefully, looking through keyholes to find out what some psychiatric staff were doing to take advantage of vulnerable female patients. A mirror of the psychosis of our conditions. I sneaked back to my bed. During this quiet time, a soft breeze brought the smell of fresh roses from a garden nearby. The smell was faint but made me remember something from a long time ago. It was the memory of when I was young and used to visit my grandmother's house on the edge of the village. Look at the little Pamela of yesterday, she exclaimed. And any Lolo, I've just come to say hello, I told her. This is your home. You can stay as long as you want. I know Grandma, but Mama said I should return today. Ha, huh, your mother married that man after the death of your father. You were just two years old, she said. My grandmother, Malolo Onima, was a gentle soul who had seen the passing of many seasons. Her humble home exuded a sense of timelessness, its walls bearing the stories of generations. In the heart of her home, a fire perpetually crackled, casting a warm glow that seemed to reflect the love that she had for me. Her eyes, like pools of wisdom, would light up upon my arrival. She would envelop me in her embrace, a cocoon of comfort, the love my mother was not able to give to me. Her husband was her everything and I was nothing. The aroma of simmering stews and freshly fried acro buns would embrace me as I stepped inside. Malolo's culinary skills were legendary, each dish, igusi, or okro soup, infused with the warmth of her heart and the wisdom of years. She would regale me with tales of her own youth, of a time when the world was simpler yet filled with its own challenges. Amidst those challenges, there was love, a love that had carved its place in the very foundations of her home. Malolo, a spirited young woman with a heart as fierce as the African sun, had grown up hearing stories of her ancestors. She was a living library, or should I say a book encyclopedia of Igbo culture and medicine. She was a wise woman. At times, she would speak of my grandfather, a man of strength and kindness, who had long departed from this world. Her eyes would glimmer with a mixture of nostalgia and longing as she recounted their days together, their laughter, their shared dreams, and the first time she met him in the bustling village market. 
she was just 16 years old, vibrant, and full of life, while James Onyema was an elderly man equal to her father, a figure of respect and wisdom in their community. It was a day that began like any other, the market alive with vibrant colors, the air thick with the fragrance of spices, and the sounds of bartering. Malolo moved through the crowd, a basket of fresh vegetables, fish, and red pepper in her arms, her gaze keen on her quest for the juiciest mangoes. In a corner of the market, she spotted a commotion. People gathered around an elderly man, his white hair like a cloud in the midst of a storm. It was James Onima, revered for his wisdom and sought after for his guidance. As she approached, a spirited debate had erupted among the villagers, and James, with a twinkle in his eyes, was holding his ground. Malolo couldn't resist the temptation to join the discussion. She stepped forward, her voice carrying a bold confidence that belied her youth. But, Baba James, she began, her eyes flashing with determination, I've heard stories of courage and resilience. Stories of our ancestors who faced impossible odds and triumphed. James Onyema turned his gaze toward her, his wrinkled face breaking into a wry smile. Ah, it seems our young woman has joined the fray, he remarked, his voice filled with amusement. Their exchange soon evolved into a spirited debate, their words a dance of intellect and passion. Malola was undeterred, her spirit matching James's wit for wit. It was as if the very air around them crackled with positive energy, an undeniable connection between two kindred souls. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting a warm, golden radiance over the market, their debate subsided. The crowd dispersed, leaving Ma Lolo and James standing alone amidst the fading echoes of their jokes. James Onima looked at her with newfound respect. He was dazzled by her twinkling eyes. You, my young girl, possess the fire of our ancestors. I see their spirit in you. He told her caressing her cheeks. Malolo's heart raced, her cheeks flushed with a mix of pride and exhilaration. And you, Baba James, have wisdom that transcends time. Your energy is as sweet as honey, their eyes met, and at that moment, they both knew that something greater than friendship had happened. Love Hook Two souls, generations apart, had forged an unbreakable bond amidst the hustle and bustle of the village market. It was the beginning of a love story that would echo through the ages, a love that defied the constraints of time and tradition. Little did they know that their journey together would be filled with challenges, trials, and the skepticism of their community. But in that moment, none of that mattered. All that mattered was the electric spark that had ignited between them, a love destined to endure, just like the tales of their ancestors. As the sun would dip below the horizon, casting long shadows across the village, Malolo would usher me to a corner of the room, where a weathered rocking chair stood. It was here that she would sing to me, her voice a lullaby woven with the threads of tradition. The melodies were like a bridge, between the past and the present, carrying the weight of oral traditions. In those moments, as her voice filled the air and the fire crackled, I felt a profound sense of belonging. Malolo's love was a steady beacon, illuminating the ordinary world that was her haven and mine, a world where time seemed to stand still, where the embrace of family and the stories of ancestors were the foundations that held us together. And so, those visits to my grandmother's house became the anchor of my youth, a sanctuary where love blossomed amidst the simplest of moments. As I remember her now, I can still hear her voice in the rustling leaves, feel her presence in the warm breeze, and carry her love within my heart a flame that refuses to be extinguished by the passing of years. My thoughts shifted toward a group of next-door inmates, their hysteric laughter weaving through the air like a melodic thread. Their mirth transported me back to my own girlhood when dreams stretched as far as the horizon. An ache, both tender and bittersweet, welled within me, a yearning for the days of untamed innocence before the weight of adulthood cast its shadow. I recalled the days spent toiling alongside my mother and stepfather on the farms during harvests long ago. The warmth of the sun, the earthy scent of the soil, the solidarity of shared labor, all felt immediate, as though time had folded upon itself. From the depths of my thoughts emerged an imaginary lover who wove his way into the ocean of my thoughts. It all started one fateful Tuesday. The nurses gave me drugs to calm down my nerves, but I couldn't sleep either because of the side effects. 
As I was lying on the bed, letting the weariness of the day wash over me, I felt a sudden chill in the room. A cold breeze, far too icy for a harmattan season, wrapped around me like an invisible cloud in my small room. I was shivering like a leaf on my bed. This is madness. In the corner of my eye, I saw a fleeting shadow, a silhouette, a shape that seemed too human to be a mere trick of the light. My heart raced as I tried to make sense of what was happening. And then, there he was, standing before me, a man, tall and enigmatic, with hauntingly beautiful eyes that seemed to hold the secrets of the universe. Who are you? I stammered, my voice trembling as I clutched at the couch's armrest. He didn't speak, but his presence spoke volumes. He was ethereal, a shimmering figure bathed in an otherworldly glow. I couldn't see him clearly, but I could sense his energy, his essence, and it was intoxicating. I am a jike, he answered me. Over the weeks that followed, he returned, always on Tuesdays and Fridays. We never spoke, never exchanged words, yet there was an unspoken understanding between us. On those nights, as I lay in my bed, he would materialize beside me. His touch, though cold as death, sent shivers of warmth coursing through my veins. The sensation of his presence, the weight of his phantom form pressing against me, was both eerie and intoxicating. I couldn't deny the allure of this inexplicable connection. He became my secret, my solace, my forbidden lover, in the dark of night. I feel protected by him. He became my companion, my source of strength, when I felt my own reserves waning. His whispered words of encouragement would guide me through the darkest hours, a beacon of light in the labyrinth of my struggles. He held me together when I felt like I was falling apart, due to my solitude in the psychiatric home. Though invisible, he was there for me. But one Friday night, I made a mistake that would change everything. Another man, a living, breathing man, caught my eye. He was one of the inmates, a former psychiatrist doctor, who became mad. The temptation was too great, and I succumbed to his advances. We made love in my room. I awoke, the next morning, with a sense of dread, gnawing at my heart. I had betrayed my spirit husband, the one who had haunted my life in the most enchanting way. Guilt washed over me like a tidal wave as I realized the gravity of my infidelity. As I lay in bed that Saturday morning, I felt a presence in the room, but it was different this time. It was charged with anger and betrayal. Before I could react, I was yanked out of bed by an unseen force, tossed about like a baby doll. I screamed in terror, but there was no one there to hear me. My invisible lover had transformed into a vengeful spirit and become extremely jealous. His presence, once comforting, had now turned into a source of fear and unease in my life. The beating was merciless, a punishment for my transgression. I was bruised and battered, both physically and emotionally. And then, as abruptly as it had begun, it stopped. I lay on the floor, gasping for breath, tears mingling with the pain. He had made his point clear. I was his, and he would not tolerate betrayal. From that day forward, I knew better than to stray from our unusual arrangement. I was bound to my enigmatic spirit husband, for better or worse, in a love that defied the boundaries of life and death. As I lay there, nursing my wounds, I couldn't help but wonder who he was, what he was, and why he had chosen me. The answers remained elusive, hidden in the shadows of a love story unlike any other. But the beating I had endured, the pain I had felt, it was all too real. It was a stark reminder that my connection with this enigmatic spirit husband was not a mere fantasy or a figment of my imagination. It was a haunting reality that I couldn't escape. As I gained a better understanding of myself, my connection with my spirit husband began to change. He no longer appeared as a vengeful presence, but as a spectral companion, a reminder of the strength I had found within myself. I realized that my spirit husband was not an external force to be feared, but a part of my own psyche that I had projected onto the world. He was a symbol of my own inner struggles and desires, and by coming to terms with him, I had come to terms with myself. I marveled at how a spirit could love a woman like me. Yet, with the passing of seasons, a change began to unfold. A jike, once a mere specter of desire, became an embodiment of my own growth. He evolved from a crutch to a mirror, reflecting the changes within me. 
His comforting words changed from being things I heard from outside to thoughts I repeated inside my head. The power I used to look for in him, I realized, was something I had inside me all along. As my journey within the hospital continued, Ajayk ceased to be a separate entity and merged with the essence of my being. He became the embodiment of my own will to heal, my determination to find my way back to the world outside those sterile walls. In his imagined form, I found the courage to confront my fears, to face the demons that had brought me to this place. Ajayk, my imaginary lover and spirit husband, ceased to be just a presence, he became a symbol of protection, a reminder that even in the depths of despair, the human spirit can find its way back to a positive life. He became my companion, his energy a reflection of my survival from my mental illness, called madness. But I feel like a normal person. And so, as I look back now, I see Ajayk not just as a figment of my imagination, but as a catalyst for change. He guided me through the labyrinth of my thoughts, and in doing so, he guided me back to myself. A vignette unfolded, moments spent by the river's edge, the sun painting the waters in resplendent hues. He would sing to me, a melody of devotion that still resonated within me, a cheerful tune from the past. A knock at my door diverted my attention, ushering in a moment of lightness. A smile tugged at my lips as I witnessed the simplicity of joy. Such moments, I reflected, were like small gifts bestowed upon the heart by the hands of fate. It was the psychiatric doctor who came to examine me. All the female patients love him for he is genteel and the words from his mouth are better than any injection, elongating shadows across my soul, deepening my reflections, an introspective tide that carried me into myself. The river of time meandered through my consciousness, revealing bends and rapids navigated, losses endured, and pockets of jubilation cherished as I listened to this man. He wore a luminous white blouse. In this suspended juncture, between the stumbling blocks of yesteryears and my state of bewilderment, I found myself. Memories, stirred by the ordinary and the overlooked, wove themselves into the fabric of my life's journey. The village square, the laughter of children, the fragrance of fresh harvests, they all became threads in the intricate journey of my existence. As life's rhythm continued to pulse within the walls of the psychiatric home, I remained there, embracing the grace in life's everyday cadence. Amidst the symphony of remembrances, I held on to the song of a jack in my heart, a melody that tethered me to a time when love was as natural as the wind rustling the leaves, a timeless refrain that comforted me in the embrace of solitude. In that blossoming garden, I experienced the very first whispers of nature's enchantment, an allure that remains as vivid in my memory as the present moment. A fleeting smile, tugged gently at the corners of my lips, a silent tribute to the vignettes of days long gone. As I lingered in the sanctuary of my quaint room, I found myself transported to places as though my thoughts had sprouted wings. It was a refuge from the reality I couldn't fully embrace. In those moments, desires I yearned for but couldn't possess in the waking world would dance before me, like ephemeral fireflies on a hot night. Among these dreams, one was especially persistent, a desire that sent tendrils of confusion and turmoil through me. It was my body's unspoken craving for pleasure, an insistent whisper that refused to be silenced. I often found myself suppressing these desires, my inner monologue a chant of restraint, reminding me that such pleasures were not within my reach. There was no need to dream, I would tell myself, no need to entertain these fantasies that seemed as unattainable as the stars. But despite my efforts, the thoughts would persist, a relentless tide that would swell within me until it became a tempest I struggled to quell. It was an uninvited guest, always lurking at the fringes of my consciousness, a hunger that couldn't be sated by mere denial. Then, there were the nurses, the attendants of my reality, the ones entrusted with my well-being. They would come, bearing a series of tablets that were meant to bring me to sleep, to envelop me in a haze of chemically induced slumber. Those moments were bittersweet, the drugs would transport me to an ephemeral euphoria, a respite from the confines of my circumstances. And yet, even in the haze of those drug-induced dreams, a part of me protested. A whisper would rise from the recesses of my mind, a protest against the chemical oblivion they offered. These nurses will drug me to death, I would murmur, my voice a fragile echo in the sterile air. 
It was a cry of resistance against a reality that sought to suppress my very essence, a plea to reclaim my sanity even within the narrow confines of my subdued existence by the system that declared me mad. In that blossoming garden of memories, in the sanctuary of my room's solitude, and even in the shadowed embrace of those drugged slumbers, I found fragments of myself, fragments that refused to be confined, desires that persisted against the odds, and a voice that, however feeble, dared to speak out against the currents that sought to pull me away from my pains, confusion, and conflict. The following morning, I found myself standing outside the doctor's room. The nurses informed me that the doctor wished to meet with me. Their customary approach involved delving into the recesses of one's mind, uncovering its darker facets. My heart raced, aware that I was on the edge of revealing my most profound secrets. Among the patients, there was a shared conviction that they weren't truly deranged. It seemed plausible that the authentic madness resided within the doctors and nurses themselves. As I looked at my surroundings, a courtyard came into view, inhabited by patients whose insanity seemed to have escalated to a chaotic crescendo. They appeared ensnared within their own labyrinthine thoughts. Nurses clad in white blouses conversed in hushed tones as if discussing matters too difficult to voice openly. The atmosphere carried an undertone of everyone's unspoken sexual desires, both fellow patients and I became objects of critical observation for the medical staff. Amidst this enigma, a question arose within me. Pamela, how did you find yourself in this place? The door creaked open, revealing a room that embodied both curiosity and compassion. The doctor, a figure of authority and understanding, gestured for me to enter with a nod. Come on in, Pamela, the doctor calls my name. As I stepped inside, I couldn't help but feel as though the walls themselves were urging me to release the burden that had haunted me for years. My gaze locked onto the doctor's, his eyes reflecting a mix of intrigue and empathy. He began to speak, his gentle words caressing my soul in a way that aimed to win my trust, before our conversation even began, he instructed me to lie on a long couch. I did not hesitate to obey. Time seemed to stretch, and in moments like this one, my only wish was to devise new strategies to appear as a mad person, or at least to conceal my true story and share fabricated tales. Do you trust me? he asked me. Yes, doctor, I replied. I am here to assist you, Miss Pamela. Please share your story. Before I could utter a word, a nurse I greatly feared entered the room carrying the file that contained everything about me from when I was only ten years old to the time I became a mad woman at the age of twenty-five. It held a statement given by my mother before she passed away, detailing accusations against my stepfather. Sadly, she had died from a stroke. Even though I was young at the time, my family members and sisters insisted it was a natural death. The crimson file about me documented all my characteristics, schizophrenia, nymphomania, mood swings, impulsive laughter, and anger. After listening to my story, the doctor and the disciplinary committee would make a decision about releasing me from the psychiatric hospital. The gloomy atmosphere killed my spirit. Nurse, you may leave now, the doctor instructed. Behind the closed doors, the doctor, a handsome man with a mustache and goatee affectionately known as Dr. Sexy, encouraged me once more to share my story. My name is Pamela Okachukwu, I began in a timid voice. My childhood home, located five hours away from the charming city of Awari, is in a village. The house is very simple, it has old masks and black and white pictures of the Okachukwu family. These photos show the Okachukwu family's history including a big picture of my mother and her husband. My stepfather, Mr. Okachukwu, was a melancholic and violent man, always beating my mother. He looked like he had a lot of authority, but there was so much pain in his heart. He had a secret in his heart that he never told anyone. Even though he carried this madness, he showed us little kindness. I paused, feeling tears trickling down my cheeks. The doctor rose from his seat and approached me now sitting on the same couch where I was lying on my back. He held my hands, encouraging me to continue with my story. It all started at the age of ten, I said. What do you mean? I'm your doctor. Tell me what really happened. You can tell me everything. Okay, doctor. I will try, but it's not easy. 
It's not my fault. Listen, Pamela, my duty is to heal you. So, it was on a Sunday morning when my mother and five sisters were preparing to go to church. My stepfather said I should stay at home to help him out with some errands in the house. Nobody dares contradict him in the house. I stayed behind. My stepfather called me to join him in the bedroom. He was standing in front of me naked and I saw his manhood pointing at me. At that point, I fainted and it was when I woke up on his bed that I realized that I was no more a virgin. There was blood everywhere on the bed sheet and my little vagina suffered from his hard thrusts, just like it was a punishment he meted on me. When my mother and sisters came back from the church, they realized what happened to me, but it seemed normal to them. Don't let anyone know, my mom cautioned me. Your mother's attitude looks absurd, the doctor said. Yes. My sisters told me they were abused too. So, how long did this nonsense last? Well doctor, I am ashamed to tell you. Miss Pamela, I am not here to judge you. Okay, doctor. It lasted until I turned 16 inch. And why did you allow it for so long? It was a rotation, my mother at night, and my sisters during the day, while I was the Sunday morning girl. Every instance, I imagined him as someone else, not the man who was supposed to be my father, but as a sugar daddy, to feel like a woman. M, strange feelings though, the doctor said. My mother, Mrs. Okachukwu, was the epitome of grace and warmth. Her laughter filled the house with joy, and her nurturing presence embraced her children with tenderness, despite the abomination we went through in the hands of her husband. Alas, that Sunday morning, she passed away in her sleep on the family bed where my father used to abuse us. She died with a big secret on her chest. She did not tell me the name of my father. A few weeks later, Grandma passed away. My stepfather married a new wife and abandoned us. My five sisters and I have to fend for ourselves. We paid our university school fees by frying acra and selling bread during the weekends. Customers loved the story of six beautiful sisters in the university running a lucrative business. That's my story. The doctor got up from his seat and walked over to his desk. He picked up the file that the nurse had placed there. He opened it and began to read a detailed report about how I had ended up in the psychiatric home. It stated that my friend Thelma, who lived next door to me, had brought me here. The report showed how she cared about me and had helped me come to the psychiatric home when I needed it. The report also contained conversations I had while sleeping, which the nurses wrote down. They transcribed what I mumbled during those moments. This gave the doctor a clear idea of what was going on inside my mind even when I was not fully awake. The nurses all agreed that I should be allowed to leave. I am not mad, I told the doctor. That's what the inmates say here, he replied. Then he read the report carefully, going through each page. It told the story of how I had come to be in this place, step by step. But the report wasn't just about words. The nurses also shared their thoughts and suggestions. They concurred that it was time for me to leave the psychiatric home, based on how I had progressed and changed during my time there. As the doctor read, he felt a sense of conclusion. It was like a chapter coming to an end. All the stories, the care, and the wishes for my recovery were there in the report. The doctor closed the file, signifying an ending and also a new beginning. In the quiet room, the decision to follow the suggestions in the report was clear. The doctor agreed with what everyone had said. As he prepared to write his own thoughts, he felt a connection with the stories and opinions in the report. It was as if all those different viewpoints were coming together to guide what would happen next in my journey. That was when he looked into my eyes and asked, Pamela, are you still mad? I have never been mad, doctor. That's the general song in this hospital. No one is mad, and so why are you all here? he asked. Without us, doctor, you and your nurses have no job. This shows your mind is sane, Pamela. Let me write your discharge report. You belong to the normal world now. The discharge report for Miss Pamela Okachukwa summarizes her journey at the Healer of All Healers Psychiatric Hospital. Miss Okachukwa's admission history reveals mental health disorders such as schizophrenia, nymphomania, mood swings, and chronic anger. 
Acknowledging her dedication, the report reflects confidence that she's ready to transition back into her normal life.